Thank you for joining me today again on Side by Side. I hope today finds you well. I hope to encourage you as we continue our way through Proverbs. Today the theme we're thinking about is the theme of family. Now family has always been under pressure because it is the one place where relationships are the closest and where there is a sense in which we can be more honest and more open with each other. We cannot really hide who we are, can we? And indeed, I think it's a mark of a good family where we can be accepted for who we are and express how we really feel and feel that we will be accepted even when sometimes some of those things we say or think may be, in a sense, a little contrary to the rest of the family. But there's a lot more than this, isn't there? Proverbs has certainly plenty to teach about husbands and wives. Now, I'm conscious that maybe you're listening to this today and You say, well, I'm not a husband and I'm not a wife. Okay, that I understand. But you are a child. You were born into a family and you have family experience. You may have brothers and sisters. You may have other siblings, other family members here and there scattered around the world. It's also possible that you're not yet married or you may well be married and you don't know it. And it's also possible that you have been married and you're now widowed or you may be divorced, you may be separated. I'm conscious that personal relationships go through all sorts of different experiences, and so I'm aware that people will be in different places. For the record, if you know, so many of you know, I have been. I'm a member of a family. I'm a husband. I'm a. I'm a father. <clears throat> I'm also a grandfather now, and uh, but I have been a son. And I've been a son in a family where the father and mother were separated and then where there was no parents. And so, you know, that's that's not an unusual story today for there to be all sorts of brokenness in families. So I just want you to understand that I'm not speaking as someone from some place of perfection, but a place of certainly very much a broken place. But let's think about Proverbs. Proverbs 31 is classically the passage about wives. And in some ways, it's been called the climax of the book. An excellent wife, a woman of strength, who can find? She is more precious than jewels. The heart of her husband trusts in her, and she will have no lack of gain. So says Proverbs 31, 10 and 11. I think you could say this wife is a bit of an all-rounder. She's very contented in herself. There's no sense of competition in her life or doubt about herself. She has gifts and she uses them with daily zeal. Now, although it sounds as though she does it all without ever a bit of you know, trouble or rip, uh, a ripple in her mind at all about anything, I don't think that's most likely true. I think this is telling us what she is like generally, but I'm sure the same proverb's wife will experience times of disturbance and concern. She's a human being. She's not something superhuman. We know that this doesn't mean that every wife, of course, should be involved in buying fields. It talks about her. She is you know, buying a field. She inspects it, buys it, and with her earnings, she plants a vineyard. Now, we know that we're not to take things as, as, as specifically to ourselves, but we see the principles here. She's someone who is looking ahead, someone who is thinking beyond the day that she's living in, insofar as her family is concerned, and those for whom she's responsible for, because that's one of the great characters here. She she is a responsible person. So much of what this, this wife, this noble wife does, is thinking about other people, the people for whom she has care, her husband, her children, and people working for her. It seems as though she's quite an entrepreneur. The characteristics are wonderful to see, energetic about her family, but not at the price of kindness or compassion. I think it's lovely to see that kindness. It says, when she speaks, her words are wise and she gives instructions with kindness. We don't have to sacrifice the good in order to achieve the great. Never do we have to sacrifice. And if we think we do, then what we're seeking to do is not very great at all, I think. She's wise in her spending. She's wise in her investing. She's wise in reaching out to needy people. 
she extends a helping hand to the poor and open her arms to the needy. And I think about this idea of beauty because she is called virtuous and capable. Different versions translate these words in different ways. It may be she's a strong woman, she's a beautiful woman. But I think if we take the word beautiful and we look at it through that grid, today's idea of beauty is usually on the surface. At least that's what's advertised, that's what we're sold. And billions of pounds are spent on products to make people externally beautiful and to, you know, extend the life of beauty, as it were, and to hold back the aging process. Now, there's nothing wrong with that at all in, in balance, I'm sure. But at the same time, I think that the real beauty is to be seen in the heart. So much is spoken of this woman in all she does, which flows out of her heart. And, and I think if you were to look at her, you would see a woman who is attractive because of that, her behaviour, her heart. And we know how this heart beauty develops. It's the grace of God, the love of Christ, the work of the gentle spirit, producing the fruit of the spirit within her. Love, joy, peace, patience, goodness, meekness, gentleness. Of course, alongside this, she has her cheerleaders. Because verse 28 tells us, her children stand up and bless her. Her husband praises her. So, you know, isn't that the sort of thing that is so, so powerful? Behind every attractive person, I'm going to say, yes, there are those who cheer them on. You know, the phrase is, behind every good man, there's a better woman, or something to that effect. It's not actually a proverb. It's just, it's just a sentence that we quote. But behind every attractive person, there is someone there cheering them on. And the effect of this can never fully be estimated. How many men need challenged and children? Well, yesterday, as regards the recording of this, the 14th of February was Valentine's Day. In a few weeks' time, it'll be Mother's Day. And, and the crowd leads us, as it were, you know, to respond on these two days and buy flowers and so forth. But that's not what's spoken of here in Ecclesiastes. This is an everyday normal event to be a cheerleader for your wife if you're a husband or for your mother if you're her child. And that's a challenge. And maybe we need to repent of not doing that and failing to do that and to do it with more enthusiasm. And, you know, this is not just some psychological advice. You know, people think, oh, that's great. That would be really good. The gospel thought of this first. The psychologist picked up and came along behind. This is a gospel life. This is how the gospel works out in our homes when changed lives mean changed attitudes, hearts and behaviours. But the second thing, and it's only brief, and I know I've given most of the time to thinking about the wife, but the second is the topic of children and parents. And it applies to each one of us. Well, maybe we're not a parent yet, but we sure are a child. And Proverbs says at least two or three things. It says, A wise son makes his father glad, but a foolish man despises his mother. If one curses his father or mother, his lamp will be put out in utter darkness. And the sense of respect that is to be drawn and understood in Proverbs towards parents is very clear. And that means to treat with weight their, and, a, and appropriately their good counsel. To value our parents, to respect our parents, to honour our parents. And that means not only if they are with us, but it could also be that they're no longer with us. And we continue to be inspired by them. So as parents then, what do we do? We inspire our children as we live lives of honesty, grace, radically faithful to Christ. We inspire and help them as we accept them in their characteristics, as we help them to develop and grow and become adults, not to stay as adolescents forever, never taking responsibility for their lives, but helping them to get on and get out there and, and develop as people. And never being afraid to apply, to apply that loving, and I emphasize the word loving, discipline where it is appropriate. And always remembering that God has wonderfully drawn us into his family by the death of his son. And this new family means that even though our own family might not have or even be a very wonderful experience, we truly have a wonderful family 
in our perfect Heavenly Father with our many brothers and sisters whom God is still working on. And we can rejoice in this, and from this gospel family we find help and strength to be gospel husbands, gospel wives, gospel children, and gospel members of our biological family in much more meaningful ways. So may the Lord bless you and I as we strive for this by His grace.